Okay, we are recording. It's so funny. Very excited to. Sorry. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. It's so funny. So on here, it's like you can't leave the session once you start recording. They're like, you're here forever. Yo, you're locked in. This is a legally binding contract. That's so. awesome. I'll let you start your own podcast. Sorry. <laughs> no, that's good. Probably, you know what? Let's just go with that. Let's just play into this. This is a chat. We don't have to have a formal, fancy intro. That is today's guest, Emily Ford. Um, We'll get into her hiking prowess here in a second. Uh, you probably are already familiar with it if you read the trek or are on the internet, but uh, very excited to talk all about hiking in Wisconsin in the winter today with Emily Ford. Thank you for joining us. Of course. So let's start off with a bit of your background. I wanna learn um, where are you from originally and how and when did you get into backpacking? Yeah, oh, I'm from, um born and raised in Minnesota my whole life. Um, I'm originally from a suburb of the Twin Cities. Then after college, I moved to Duluth on a whim with a roommate of mine from college. And uh, kind of just, that's it. <laughs> that's as far as we got. I have not left here. Neither of us have. We love Duluth. Um, and I didn't really start backpacking until I moved to Duluth either. My family, they were pretty outdoorsy. Um, growing up, but we were more like snow machines, ice fishing, four wheeling, stuff like that. So um, human powered things was not was not really a thing. So yeah, I feel I feel like ice fishing is mandated by law in that part of the country. And let me say I went to school in Wisconsin. So uh, not only do I know Wisconsiners, but I feel like I know Minnesota. I've Minnesotans, I feel like are kind of the same breed as Wisconsin folks. Did you just call them Wisconsiners? Wisconsinites, Scannies. What, what, what's the correct? <laughs> yeah, a Wisconsinite. Okay, I'm a little bit rusty here. I haven't lived in the Midwest for like 15 years, so okay. I apologize. But uh, yeah, ice fishing. Everybody out there ice fishes. Yes. You get in the shanty. Lots of you drink people. A couple of beers. Did you Did you yeah. hear the crazy Midwest hot tea recently while I was out, out on the trail? Did you hear what happened on Lake Superior? No. Yeah. Uh, some folks were tested the waters a little too much on Lake Superior and the ice broke away and all of they had to get rescued by um, the Coast Guard. Huh. But they were like, oh, come get our stuff too. And they're like, we rescue humans, not stuff. And so all of this stuff, <laughs> pretty much they waited for the ice to see if it was going to come back in. And it, it didn't really. So a lot of their stuff is just at the bottom of Lake Superior now. Now, is this like a ice fishing setup they lost or what are we talking about a here? A truck. I'm picturing the people in Colorado that ice fish and they have those trucks out on the lake. Uh -huh. Usually, I don't think they would allow someone to drive a truck that far out onto Lake Superior. I don't think on the lake, though. Um, yeah. Probably like a snow machine or four wheeler or something like that. They, but they had to get out there somehow. So, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Damn, that's wild. Yikes. The other Midwest thing I want to bring up is I know lots of Minnesotans and I don't detect the accent whatsoever. Or maybe it'll show up a little bit <laughs> later in the interview. I like but, to hide uh, my I like to hide my accent. I've actually okay. vehemently uh, tried to pick up other accents to hide my Minnesotan accent. But yeah, I mean I, we can totally go that route if you need. <laughs> What's would... the best one you've got? Oh yeah, I mean our O's are really long. Boats. <laughs> you know, you, you say you know a lot. Yeah. Oh yeah, it's. Uh, I dated a girl from Sheboygan, Wisconsin, and we were at the airport one time, and we had been dating for a long time, so I heard her accent for a long time. But for some reason, this phrase just absolutely destroyed me. She goes, "Do we do we need tags for our bags?" And like, I had to stop <laughs> in the middle of the airport so I could sit down and laugh. Um, so yeah, so the O's and the A's, those are both. It's so funny that people make fun of us because Minnesotans are like the number one sought out. Or like Midwesterners are number one sought out folks for like live TV. Huh. I, I've presented that fact to, I believe it was Gary Sizer. And then he told me that apparently the Pennsylvania accent is the thing. Maybe I just think maybe every region has been brainwashed to believe that okay. like their, their accent <laughs> is the one that's sought after. Sure, but, right. uh, I'm on your team with that. Oh, that's I fine. I could be wrong. Accent. I probably heard that through no. like some bar trivia somewhere. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> Um, okay, so you have a background in the outdoors, but not so much. You said it was more machine-based outdoor stuff. Um, so when did the your intro into hiking and backpacking begin? My very first intro was when I was younger. I had a really good friend who lived in northern Minnesota. Um, and 
her family actually took me canoeing in the boundary waters for the, when I was, man, we, we were maybe like 10 years old or something like, so that was my very first like taste of sleeping under the stars. It was super cool. Um, but backpacking like this, let's see, my dog is five years old. So I've been here for six years. So about like six, five and a half, six years ago is when I started up here. And it's really when I moved to Duluth. And the first time I went out, looking back on it was miserable. I had like this three person, I was alone. I went solo on the spear hiking trail. Uh, my backpack probably weighed as much on that trip, which was a three day trip as it did on my winter hiking trip that I just finished. Um, like my kitchen setup was like a, like a pot, like a real pot with like real like knife, fork, spoon, all metal. I like put my oil in like glass jars. It's like, <laughs> I don't even know. My pack was, I just remember being exhausted. Um, so that being said, I mean, I do think anybody could go out and hike, but you just learn better practices over time, <laughs> like whatever. But, yeah. Yeah. So we talked about this a little bit before we hit the record button, but uh, Allison Kylie, I, I said it wrong the first time. Kylie, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, she gave me a little bit of intel that you guys were on the same rugby team. I'm actually curious how much that plays into your tenacity as a hiker or do you just fall into both because you're so tenacious? Like, do you feel like rugby trained you for backpacking, especially like what you're describing, carrying, you know, actual silverware and oil and glass jars? Like, I feel like just having like a, like a bulletproof mentality is going to benefit you. And I feel like that's something that's going to be ironed out while playing rugby. Right. Well, after high school, my plan was to just go into the military. And actually I wanted to go in my dream of dreams, I would have gone the Marines route. And I think I would have been a fantastic Marine because um, that mentality and that just mindset is something I naturally lean towards anyway. Um, but yes, rugby was like uh, very formative for my brain. Like my coach, and many times while I was backpacking, I could just hear my coach. We called him Coach Fitness. He was like this six foot whatever dude built. I mean, this man like ran on just pure air. I don't know. He he just had life flowing through every bulging vein on his body, and <laughs> uh, he would just scream at us. He'd be, he'd be like, "Empty the tank! Empty the tank!" Like in the last end of the half, and he'd be like, "This is it. You gotta let it all out right now." He's like, "You'll rest later." And like on the trail, like on those really long days, I'd be like, all right, it's time to empty the tank. Like it's, you know, <laughs> it's night outside, but I can sleep for a few hours and it'll be better by tomorrow. Like just empty it. Like, here we go. So definitely formative. So, so was his mantra playing in your mind while you were hiking? It sounds like maybe it oh, was. Absolutely. Yeah. And so and my role playing rugby was I was a forward. So I tackled, my job was to tackle the person who had the ball, no matter like how fast they were, no matter how big they were. And the thing about rugby versus like American football is like you tackle the person and then either you're fighting for the ball or you're getting them just running around again and sprinting. There's like no time to lay down. If you lay down, they mostly you're injured. Right. So you're like tackling and then you're just up again, <laughs> like somehow running on adrenaline. So that mentality definitely kind of pushed, you know, doing it kind of always does doing through hikes, I suppose. Did that influence you wanting to do a winter hike because it would be more challenging or there would be more difficulties in it? Or what made you want to do a winter hike? <laughs> right, right. I guess I don't like really seek to make my life more difficult than it needs to be. I think that comes naturally. Uh, so I put myself in weird situations. Um, in my normal life, I'm a gardener. I work at a historic house museum in town here and uh, I just get the winters off. I get laid off for three months. And the rest of the season is so busy that I can't really take that much time off. So I was kind of, I, I guess I had a choice, but I just went with the easiest choice. You know, the one where I had three months off. Easiest. Well, right. Easiest. Well, I didn't have to use any of my like PTO or vacation time to you know take a two month hike. You know, it was awesome. So, I'm curious from like a sports fitness standpoint because rugby is very like explosive uh with type one muscle fibers and backpacking is obviously much slower like almost boring cardio yes. D was there an adjustment from like a collegiate level high intensity athlete to something a lot slower or did you notice that like 
were you starting from scratch or were you you were in such good shape that the adjustment was pretty seamless for you? Right. So on this trip, I did get a long muscle injury. My my quad had been had gotten so tight over the first week just due to the way that I was walking, um, and especially on those hard road walks uh, that was pulling on my patellar tendon, and it was making my kneecap get off track. And so my body had a bit of an adjustment to that, but um, my body's very strong. Um, when the gyms were open 100%, like no masks, um, I competitively power lifted for a couple of years when I moved up here. Um, and, and I've been in, my sister and I both love to lift. Um, we love feeling strong and everything like that. So even though my body had to adjust to doing like slow, long distance, I think feel like my muscles are strong enough that that transition wasn't as painful, I guess, as it could have been for someone doing like couch to 1000 miles, I guess, you know what I mean? But I knew that yeah. I knew that I was going to have to deal with some weird body stuff because I've never been um, a long distance person, but I know that one of my strengths is just plodding along. I'm very good at just moving, even if it's really slowly. Mm. Um, so yeah, a little, a little bit of both. Powerlifting background. That's interesting. I wonder if there's an advantage that like that must really build your joints, tendons, yeah. ligaments, that sort of thing, which is crucial for backpacking. I think that's the thing that people don't really consider. Like they go out for runs and try to build up their cardio, but like the connective tissue is the thing that often fails for people. And I bet powerlifting is probably a great advantage for that. Yes, I would. So if anybody was trying to get better at literally any sport in their life, I cannot think of a sport that would not be benefited by powerlifting at all. Mm. How do you get into that? was like the weirdest cracky. I'm sorry, <laughs> everyone who just listened to that. I'm really sorry. Um, how do you get into like powerlifting? Because Zach made me go to a CrossFit class one time. <laughs> And it, like just going into a CrossFit class was the most intimidating thing in my life. Yeah. But like, I can't imagine going to a gym and like approaching one of those bars and being like, I'm going to put some weights on you and lift you up and put you back down. <laughs> right. Like, that's just, that's not what's going to happen spoken when I go to the Spoken like gym. a true gym rat. That's yeah. Crazy. Like that's, it's so funny. It is start? spoken like a true gym rat. That's how exactly how I approached the bar. I'm like, I have to lift you up and put you back on or don't I? <laughs> like deadlifting <laughs> is just picking a bar up off the ground and then setting it down nicely. <laughs> uh, gentle, gentle. so the way so i started lifting in high school junior high i started lifting in junior wow. high um i did not start to compete until i was in my 20s after college but i've always loved lifting the way i would say if someone was like i want to competitively do it find a coach and that's like there happened to be a coach nearby to where i was and he was buddies with a, um, a bodybuilding coach that a friend of mine used. Um, but if you don't know what you're doing at all in the gym and like those bars are really intimidating, um, secretly start at home with like a broomstick. Like go on YouTube and like look look for videos and like just start with a broomstick at home and like take videos. The biggest thing is taking videos of yourself. Like some people in the gym just take videos of themselves because they think they're really hot and whatever. And they're like, oh yeah, look at me like for the gram, you know? But four. Yeah, right. It, <laughs> yes. But actually, like, I genuinely just took videos to look at my form to make sure that my body was kind of in line and I wasn't going to hurt myself. Because once you get to such heavy weight, we've all seen those like videos on YouTube of people dropping weight on themselves. And you're just like, I don't want that to be me. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Pre pandemic, when I had a 24 hour uh, gym membership, when I see people deadlift, like oftentimes because there's not like people very rarely do personal training there. You see the arched back and like people doing like a semi squat stance when they're doing deadlifts. Like, yeah, you just see terrible, terrible form and you know, they're able to move the weight, but I just, I worry for people's lower backs. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. absolutely. Did that, did that help with when you were like carrying your stuff for the winter hike? Cause that was one thing I noticed when I was looking at your pictures and like one thing that I always think besides all of the other factors would keep me from wanting to do a winter through hike is that like your bag looks huge and like so heavy right um did that help carry the load because like i can't imagine like moving several feet with something of that size right so yeah disclaimer for anybody who sees the pictures of my pack on online um 
it was like six. It was between sixty and sixty-five pounds, which is very heavy. It oh. was just very bulky looking. Also, the way I packed it was extremely bulky looking. That was my own fault. Um, but yes, my my legs. I have very big thighs. <laughs> That's just kind of the the name of the game in my life. Um, I never I never wish to have a thigh gap because I don't know where my why I don't know what would happen to my legs. I guess. Um, <laughs> and yeah, they are they've always been very strong. Um, and very powerful and that's uh, the pack was very felt heavy but it never felt uh unmanageable i guess so we should set the full context here because i feel like we've kind of eased into it but for the people who might not be familiar with what you've just accomplished can you give us the full spiel and a little bit more about what the ice age trail is yeah so i what are we at? Three weeks or something like that? Some Yeah, about three weeks ago, I finished the Ice Age Trail in Wisconsin, um, which is a 1,200-mile trail total. Um, for, but for a thru-hiker, you're not required to do all 1,200 due to some weird trail things. Um, and I did about a little over 1,100 miles um, through a Midwest winter. I started on December 28th and finished on March 6th. Um, and I started on the eastern end and hiked west. It goes, it, it's a weird route because it follows the last glaciation uh, that Wisconsin saw before it was called Wisconsin, I'm sure. Um, and so it takes this really weird route from Pottawatomie State Park and then it heads south for many, many, many miles. You're like 60 miles from Illinois, actually. Then you head north for many, many miles and then you start heading west to St. Croix Falls. Um, so it's, I call it, personally, I call it the longest way across Wisconsin possible. Um, <laughs> it definitely is. It does make like a crazy horseshoe shape. Yeah. Yep. Um, they, they really they really drag out the mileage on that trail for sure. Yeah. So you know, let's also set the context a little bit more. I, if I'm not mistaken, you're the first woman to ever do a winter through hike of the uh, Ice Age Trail and just the second person ever, period. Yeah. yeah. Now, does that go to speak to how difficult the endeavor is or just how crazy you have to be to want to be outside of Wisconsin for that long? You know, I don't know. It's so yeah. because I, so, so the way I heard about this trip was just through a friend. We were out playing bar league volleyball, right? And I wanted to do a thousand mile hike in the Midwest. I love backpacking in the Midwest. Um, hmm. I mean, mountains are fine too, but I really love the Midwest. Um, and she told me about the Ice Age Trail. And like at that moment, I was just like, sure, sweet, sounds great. And I didn't really think, I knew Mike had done it. Mike Summers had done it. And I was like, cool, it looks doable since some dude did it a couple winters ago. It never like crossed my mind to be like, oh, I'm the second person that I'm, that's going to ever do this, you know? Um, Were there like, so the photos I was looking at, and it was just in a couple of articles where it was just like flat terrain, you know, through a nice forest. Mm -hmm. What's the terrain like? Like, was there parts that were difficult? Were there parts that were um, dangerous? Or was it just like nice flat going through? Because also I saw that you did it in your 69 days, which first off, nice. Um, <laughs> but also, <laughs> like, that's like fun. <laughs> 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 I hope I'm not. You are. Easy, Leave easy it to date. backpacker radio. <laughs> But uh, that's like 500 miles a month, which seems like average for summer time, let alone winter time. Oh, we chugged along, man. We chugged along for sure. Um, right. Do not let those photos <laughs> look. This is how I got in trouble. <laughs> because I so I, pull, I was pulling a pulk for the first week. I was pulling a sled behind me. Because I saw all those photos that looked flat, and I was like, totally, man. <laughs> This is going to be so easy. Put most of the weight in the sled, haul it on the snow, convert it to wheels on the roads. Awesome. Dude, it gets so hilly. Like, hmm. it gets... The way that the glacier sat on that land made these sections crazy hilly. I mean, just long, long hills. Were they, like, ridges that you'd have to, like, you know, watch your footing on because of the snow? Um, or was it just, like, rolling hills that didn't really provide any, like, technical difficulty? No. The only spot where it's, like, a weird ridge is at Devil's Lake, probably. Because um, there's a really – it's a drop-off. It's, um, it's a bluff of some sort, more so than anything. But what a lot of these are is are, like, eskers or moraines. So they're, like, these long – 
I don't have anything here to show you any geology, but there's like these, they're like these long, they can be really steep to get up to them, but then there's these long, not ridges because they're kind of rounded or flat at the top. Um, and I'm sure because you're asking the person who hiked it in the winter, right? So it's a little different because it is technical. Sometimes the snow would be up to my knees. So that's more of a technical thing. I didn't have snowshoes at that. I didn't take snowshoes after my first week. Um, so that'd be more of the technical <laughs> part for somebody who's hiking it in the summertime, your biggest ne- technical parts are going to be doing river crossings. There's several mm. river crossings that you have to figure out how to get yourself through. Um, hey, had you hiked much of the trail in summer? Did you scout it out at all? I flashed it. And I wanted to flash it. I wanted to, like, I barely looked at the terrain in the book. Um, I, like, scrolled through a few things, like, on the pages. But I knew that I didn't want to know anything about it and just hmm. kind of see it for itself. I kind of think that's the fun way to do it. That's what I did with the AT. Yeah, but you didn't hike it in the winter. No, of course not. It's like not nearly as impressive. It's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying I like going in blind. Yeah, no, I would be, if I was doing something like this, I would be like a resort, a research whore. I would yeah. want to know everything. So I applaud, I applaud your, uh, your courage and just going into this blind. So you, you said that you only had snowshoes for the first week or you had sh- snowshoes after the first week? I, I only had snowshoes the first week and I didn't need snowshoes until getting closer to the, probably for the last couple hundred miles. Um, there Mm -hmm. wasn't much snow and excuse me, a lot of people kind of had gone out ahead of me and tramped down the trail with their snowshoes. Um, a lot Mm -hmm. of the trails on uh, on the road or on snowmobile trails or on, um, ski trails, stuff like that. So a lot of it's on that as well. So there's a lot of post tolling. That was probably the toughest days ever. Cause you're going, I ended up going like a half mile an hour on those days that I was post tolling. Mm. And that was frustrating. Cause I could, I know that I can hike between two and a half and three miles an hour. And just, that was like draining. So what was this Wisconsin winter like? Um, because I already mentioned this, I went to school in Wisconsin. I think everyone knows this at this point, but uh, I don't know if I mentioned this on the show, but the day that I, gra- I graduated in December, took me four and a half years. Uh, the day that I graduated, it was negative 40 degrees in Madison, southern Wisconsin. Yeah. So I imagine like up by uh, Superior, Duluth, it was probably somewhere in the range of like negative four to 500 degrees. So, <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> so yeah, what was the 2021, 2020, 2021 winter like for you? The beginning one was actually pretty nice. If I recall hanging out around zero in like single digit <laughs> positives, um, then when I hit rush halt, it, it all flipped and became very, very cold. Um, I think before that, my coldest night was like probably negative 15, which was man- very manageable. But then that really cold snap came and then all of a sudden it was like negative 30 at nighttime. And the wind chill was like negative 40, whatever, blah, 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 50, blah, blah, blah. Um, and so on those nights, I definitely made sure to find a spot inside to stay I, what we haven't mentioned yet also is I had a dog with me and mm. she's, she, although she's an Alaskan Husky, I found it to be extremely unfair for me to be in this lovely, fantastic uh, you know, sleeping bag. And she was just in her fur, you know? So, yeah. So did she not sleep with you in the sleeping bag? I, I know dogs are different. Like no. Chance's dog, she, she uh, piles in with you, right? Um, well, last summer she was still a puppy puppy. So she was very small. She fit very well this summer. We're going to be cuddling, but she, she'll get, she'll leave and she'll go sleep next to me in the middle of the night. Uh, Yeah. Mine refuses to sleep in my sleeping bag. And quite frankly, she's a 70 pound dog. I don't know what the logistics might make that impossible. So yeah, let's talk about your dog. I want to talk about your dog very much, uh, because the pictures, she's adorable. Um, so how did you get the idea to hike with the dog? How did you come across this dog? Give us the full story. Yeah. Well, I was, we have a dog, my partner, we have Zulu, but he's a Catahoula mix. And so he is not made for winter, um, at all. Uh, and a, a musher buddy of mine told me to post to a musher's page. And, What's a musher? Uh, like a dog sled musher, the, the human that uh, is on the sled. Um, and right. Iron Will. Uh, yes, Iron Will. Good, <laughs> I love them. Good man. job. Okay, you're the only. Thank God. 
<laughs> watch, so sorry side note for everybody i watched iron will before i left talk about things that like push me through tough moments i thought about that yeah. movie hurt near daily and i was yeah. like as like you you are iron will you can do this <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that I've seen the movie no fewer than 15 times. It was like one of my favorites when I was a kid, but it's got to have been at least 25 years, at least 25 years since I've seen it. So I like can only put very vague memories of it together. Yeah, it's fant- it's a it's a great old film. Yeah, that's it. Um, so, yes, so she she's technically a lead dog. So she'd be at the front of the pack. She's the one that listens very well. She knows her left and her right and her stops and her goes very well. She's very smart. Um, her name is Diggins, so purposely named after Jesse Diggins, our Minnesota skier, Olympic skier. Jesse Diggins is a monster. So is the dog Diggins, both monsters. Um, in very similar <laughs> ways, actually. It's pretty cool. And the farm or the kennel that Diggins came from uh, was the only one to respond to my post. So they just like let you borrow the yes. dog for the winter? Yes. It was Did you have cool. to like provide references and a bunch of stuff to make them think you're not going to run off with their dog? I tried to sell myself a little bit in the post. I was like, I, was like, I used to work at a sled kennel. I, um, I've handled sled dogs before. Like, I'm really good with my dog. I, I don't have that many references. And like other people who knew me commented on the post, like back me up a little bit. So this is just a really like a super kind family. And I don't know if this is, I don't think this is common. But they were up for the adventure and um, yeah. super thankful. And so the, I wasn't going to take a dog, but dogs are just they're fun to have along, right? Um, mm-hmm. Especially when you're alone out in the winter. It's I talked to Diggins all day long. You know, it's, that was most mm-hmm. of our day is just me talking at her, singing at her, whatever. Um, and we became very good best friends, you know, on that trip. So I don't, I don't think it's always necessarily right to bring a dog with, right? Because not all breeds are made for long distance backpacking at all so um i'm against animal abuse and forcing your dog to hike a thousand miles with you sounds terrible if they're not that type of breed but if you have a proper breed i mean man well that's why you didn't even bring your own right exactly right so yeah how did diggins respond because uh you mentioned when the weather was nice it was in the single digits on the positive direction. When it was not nice, it was less good than that. Um, I assume you're paying attention to whatever cues Diggins is giving you. Like, what what are you looking for to ensure that she's having a good time? Yeah, um, mostly a lot of pause, a lot of pause, pause. Like her feet. <laughs> um, yeah. I wasn't given pause. Um, her feet, um, just to make sure that those were okay. So we use um, something called Musher Secret, and you can use it um, in dry and warm climates. We love it. Um, it just helps their feet from cracking and kind of keeps the snowballs off their feet a little bit. Um, so I use that quite a bit. Uh, use balloon booties um, just to keep the snow off her feet mostly. Um, other than that, she did really well. She wore her coat only once, but I think she got too hot anyway. Her BTUs are crazy. Um, so I ended up cutting off two rectangles of my Thermarest, my Z-Lite, little uh, foam one, and having her sleep on that because she kept melting the snow so badly underneath the <laughs> tent that the tent would get wet and then the tent would freeze to the ground when she got up in the morning. Because she just she can just melt through layers of snow. It's crazy. Wow. Yeah. I yeah. get in my sleeping bag so fast. Yeah. You get in, get in there. <laughs> well, the, thing, the problem with having her in my sleeping bag um, was that she inherently sleeps in the snow. So she was actually wet most of the time, uh, and you don't, you know, you just don't want to have moisture inside your sleeping bag. Right. Yep. Yeah. So not only is she's not cold overnight, but she's so hot that she's just melting the ground beneath her. <laughs> yes. And this is this is this is standard for a lot of sled dogs. So like, if you go out on a sled, you know, trip or anything like that, which I'd highly recommend. The last time I was out in the morning while the dogs wake up, it's just like 15 black dots on the ground because they've just all melted the snow. It's crazy. If, if, you know, if there's ground underneath them, it's not a lake or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. So is Dickens actually pulling any of her gear or your gear? Look, no. I tried to have her pull the pulk the first week and she every time I attach it to her, she's like, look at me. She'd be like, um, excuse me, this is not my purpose for this trip. She's yeah. like, I look like a wheel dog. I'm not a wheel dog. Wheel dogs are the ones who are like at like the chonky boys at the back. Like the ones who uh-huh. like are just like kind of the the ones who are there for the 
muscle. Um, so no, she carried her own pack because I refused to carry any dog's food anymore. I did that on the, I also did that on my first backpacking trip with my dog. Never again. Dog food is so heavy. So heavy. Yeah, yeah I know. I, I became a much happier person when I got a pack for Sierra and she could shoulder her little, and it's no issue for her. Like she's doing triple the distance. She's running up and back <laughs> yeah. and down the trail the entire time. Actually to that point, Sean astutely pointed out that in all of your photos, Diggins is on leash. Yes. Um, is that to not ruffle the feathers of the LNT crowd? Or is this like a worried about Huskies running off situation? Have you ever been around a Husky? We dog sat for a husky once, so I don't think that qualifies me as a husky as expert. We've both been on the verge of buying huskies and then talked out of it. Excellent. By don't do it if you're head. not up for that lifestyle. <laughs> did, did you ever let that husky go off leash or outside of a leash, like a chain yard? No. Yes. I've heard they're escape artists. They are. How would you describe the mind of a husky? They just they don't they don't even run away. They walk away and they just keep <laughs> walking, and they'll walk. <laughs> It's just in their nature. So it was really cool with her. Well, first of all, it was nice to have her tethered to me. Number two, she's not my dog. I was not, I could not, I was not about to call up Sherry and be like, just to let you know your dog somewhere in the wilderness of Wisconsin. I thought it'd be great to have her off leash. She's still walking. <laughs> she's still walking somewhere. But it was really cool that one night, our communication was so funny between herself and my, myself. She chewed through her lead. I had her tied to a tree. And she chewed through that line. It was just P-cord. But she just sat there and looked at me. And I was like, I was like, what's, I'm like, why aren't you tied up to anything? And she just sat there. Mm -hmm. And so it was really cool. Towards the end of the trip, um, when we got into camp, I could just let her go off leash and she would stick around. But I would never mm -hmm. do that. It took like three weeks before that happened. Mm -hmm. Because she just walk away. Yeah. Do you think she stuck around because she had built like a trust with you or is it just maybe she could have done that from the get, but you didn't want to roll the dice since it's not your dog. No way, man. I think it was a trust thing. I've uh -huh. seen her run around like their open yard at their kennel. I think she would, would have wandered off for sure. Yeah. Now uh, you mentioned a few times that it's not your dog. So you had to return it my heart is breaking thinking about like the bonding experience that you two had. How was it giving her back? There's a gnarly photo of me floating around on the internet of me just <laughs> like ugly crying so hard. <laughs> like I have a vein in my forehead right here and it was just bulging out. Just like I had snot everywhere. And I was like trying to like, I had rehearsed this whole thing I was going to say when I said goodbye to her. And I just was like, <laughs> I was just like so ugly crying at the end of it. I was just like, I was like, and I was just like, fine, take her away. I was, I just collapsed on top of her because I was, I was, I thought I was ready, but like she became my best friend, you know, like she's the only one that experienced that entire trip with me. They're like, there's no, yeah. there's no other being out there, you know, that, <laughs> knows what happened <laughs> yeah it, does she live close does she live close enough where you can like stay in touch and go hang out sometimes <laughs> maybe text her i do I <laughs> her, hand. <laughs> her hand there's like super nice she'll send me photos of her she lives two and a half hours away but thankfully her family does come up to ely which is you can take the duluth route to get to ely um so i think in a couple of weeks i'm going to ask to see if she can come out and play <laughs> <laughs> That'll be an exciting reunion. When seeing a dog after there's been like any time of separation, at, at least the dogs I've had, they go insane yeah. when there is a, the rekindling. Yes. Were there any, and I imagine there were, challenges associated with bringing a dog? Because I, so can you talk a little bit about how that interfaced with your time in town? Like, did you have to get hotel, motel rooms that were dog friendly or did you not do that while you were in town? Can you talk to that a little bit? We stayed in one hotel. The Ice Age Trail is funny, um, the way it's routed, right? So there's um, like Sturgeon Bay, Manitowoc, Madison, Milwaukee, St. Croix. So there's all these big towns, but a lot of those towns you don't really go through. Um, so there's, there's that. So there's not a lot of opportunity to kind of stay at a hotel. I guess you could hitch a ride into town. Um, 
Yeah, in the winter with a dog during COVID, that sounds like yeah. <laughs> you got some factors working against you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so there was one hotel, they were dog friendly, and that was super awesome. Um, she was really good, though. I didn't even, I could just tie her up to my backpack, and she would just sit there and wait for me to come outside of a store. <laughs> um, the only time I was ever worried was when I was in a Walmart. I was like, if somebody steals this dog, I don't know why Walmart just gave me the feeling that someone was going to steal her <laughs> a little bit. Uh, I was like, please do not get stolen. Um, other than that, it wasn't bad. Um, I would eat all my meals outside with her. Even if there was indoor dining, I would just sit next to her and eat with her. Um, I felt it was, you know, important. I didn't want to be a dick and be like, ha ha, sucker. <laughs> you can't come inside. <laughs> I just, I, Town's my time. Right. Would she get, would she get town food too? That girl loves French fries and chicken nuggies. <laughs> like I have a picture of her with her head just straight up in a McDonald's bag. Like just <laughs> up to the ears in a McDonald's bag. Aww. Yes. And she looked. Did you get to hit up any fish fries while you were out there? One fish fry, it, but somebody had brought it. Uh, I stayed at a house and they had picked it up for, uh-huh. Yeah, I didn't get to drop into any fish fries, unfortunately. So the challenges, the challenges were very minimal with that. I don't, I don't really remember any. Yeah, it's also Wisconsin. Wisconsin's like the wild, wild west, man. Almost anything goes in most of those towns. Yeah, for sure. So if you only stayed in a hotel once, you mentioned that you stayed at a house once as well. What, what was your lodging situation like how often did you get to sleep indoors and grab a shower and that sort of thing i stayed inside quite a bit actually due to various circumstances and it wasn't always due to the weather um so kind of backtracking i didn't i didn't go into this trip without planning anything i had an itinerary going into it um the itinerary really went out the window but on that itinerary i did plan to stay at some of the campgrounds, which was really, it was dumb on my behalf. I should have known better um, because they were all closed. And so when I got into some of these towns, there either wasn't a viable spot for me to stay that I felt was like safe enough for me to be out of people's eyesight. So I would find somewhere to stay. Um, so three nights, three nights I knocked on doors. Several other nights I would text, I would like message people through social media um, and then some of the other nights I stayed inside, I had already pre- pre-planned it before I left. Got it. So you got friends all throughout Wisconsin? That doesn't suck. Well, now I, now I do. <laughs> I did, I did, <laughs> these, these were all strangers to begin with. Interesting. Yeah, so like I would, I so would literally we're... like salesmen knock on someone's door and ask to sleep in their yard. No did shit. They really? Yeah. And that went over okay? Only once it didn't go over okay. How did that go? The guy called the cops, and I was at a different I'm, guy's honestly, house. Honestly, I was I was I'm I was at a different guy's house, uh, just kind of shooting the. I don't know if you can swear on this podcast. Uh, oh, you can. Okay. Swear, <laughs> swear, <laughs> <right>. Great. <laughs> I was like shooting the shit with this guy at, at his house, and he wasn't certain that his wife would. Oh, I stayed in two hotels because this this happened, um, and I was chatting up with this guy, and he got a knock on his door, and it was the police. So the, I knocked on his neighbor's door about an hour before, and when the police came into this other guy's house, he's like, he's like, have you, he's like, have you seen a lost hiker? And I was like, I think I'm the lost hiker you're looking for. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he's like, Oh, you know, it's really cold outside and blah, 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 blah. And uh, it just ended up the guy's house that I was kind of chatting with. He just brought me to a motel nearby. But Damn, yeah, it was, a, it was a weird conversation. <laughs> Wisconsin people are the friendliest. So yeah. Walk us through, what is it like? You get to town, imagine at the end of a day of hiking, and how do you pick which door you're gonna knock on? Like walk me through that. That's that takes that takes massive balls. Yes, it does. Yes, I actually <laughs> said that to myself as I was doing it. The first night I had to do it, I like had this plan. I was going through this ridiculously small town. And I was like, there has to be and there were no woods. It was all farm field, and that's where I really shot myself in the foot because I thought there would be at least a patch of woods I could dive into, and there weren't any. And I was like, I was like, dude, come on. Like, you can do this. Like, be a woman. Like, come on, do this. And (laughs) I was like, all right, here's your plan. It's five o'clock. Somebody's coming home from work. You're going to catch them from when they're walking from their garage to into their house. You're going to wave them down and then ask them so you don't have to knock on their door. And it's exactly what happened. His name is Barry. He's super awesome. He's very nice. His wife was very angry that he didn't tell me to sleep inside the house, but 
they're very kind people. Um, <laughs> yeah, and that was that. Yeah. I feel like that's like how you plan getting a hitch back from like a grocery store to the trail. You're like standing outside, you've gotten rid of all the boxes and you're like, okay, first person to come out with a cart and make eye contact, I'm gonna just casually be like, oh, where's your car? <laughs> Is that your <laughs> yeah, if you wait for them to come out, you can see where they're walking towards. You're like, oh, are you going back to your car right now? Yeah, right. <laughs> so, with you. How many times did you do the, uh, the cold knocking cold calling i guess uh three three times so barry was barry two yeses and one no so barry was the first guy john was the second guy he's not from the states he had a very thick accent from somewhere else and he was so confused he was like he's like <laughs> he's, i was like he's like hey can i he was so kind because uh i was like can i sleep on in your yard and he just opens his door to let me in and I was like, I was like, oh, I was like, no, 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 no. I was, I was like, can I just sleep in your yard? And he's like, what? <laughs> yeah. And then, and then that last time with the police call. Are they, are they familiar with the Ice Age Trail? Like, is this like no. trail towns on bigger trails where they're like, oh yeah. No. These little towns have no idea that this trail goes through their backyard, mostly because that road, it's a road walk. Because if I would have been just on the trail, I would have just slept on the trail. But these are all just mm -hmm. road walks. And so you're just this weird person with a backpack and a dog walking down this county road and <laughs> knocking on doors, I guess. I don't know. So when these people are letting you or not letting you sleep in their yard, are they interacting with you at all? Like, is it literally you just get to the yard, pitch up your tent, and then you leave in the morning? Or do you, do you interact with them? How does that work? No. Usually people who let me sleep in their yard, I just, I'm just there to sleep and then I leave. Got it. Yeah. That's super cool. Um, so at what point did you start to get fanfare? Because obviously by the end of this, everyone was picking up on the story, but I imagine when you started it, um, just based on your own attitude, it wasn't like a big deal. So like, at what point did you cross that threshold? Such a good question. <laughs> I, I left my house with like 200 followers on Instagram. I started my Instagram for this trip. Um, mm because I wanted to, like, it's a cool way to keep photos and it was be an easy way to communicate with the people that I knew. Um, and a lot of those people came from my other professional Instagram because they know, they just know me as a gardener. And the first week, so I did, I did social media dumps like on just Saturdays, just once a week. Other than that, I would, I would keep my phone pretty much just on airplane mode. Um, and after my first week, there's like a thousand people following this trip. And I was like, hmm. Okay, like that's weird. I don't know where you all came from. <laughs> and then, like the next week, it was like two thousand people, and then it just kind of incrementally got larger and larger. So I, I some weird traction happened, and I, I've been telling people like I'm just always so late. Like I'm not socially awkward, but I'm always kind of late to like the social nuance party, right? Of like this is happening, and I'm like oh, it's not happening. Like whatever. <laughs> I'm like oh, it's happening, you know. So I, I have no idea what happened. Yeah. Because in my mind, right, I like, in my mind, this was just gonna be a passion trip. Like you hiked the Appalachian, like you hiked whatever, and you're like, I'm just going for a hike, and I'm like, I'm just walking mm -hmm. for a long distance in the middle of winter, which is like the Minnesota day, <laughs> you know, and it didn't seem abnormal to me, I guess. Do you have any dream gear sponsors? Just, just mentioning it on this podcast, we'll probably oh, get Oh, yeah, you. we like to manifest things. Yeah, we're going to help you. <laughs> okay. <out here>. okay. <laughs> any dream spot? I mean, any sponsor, I guess. Um, I, so the the sleeping bag I used was by Western. Or you, or you could give us a category if you'd like, and then we could uh, work keep it a little bit more broad. That way you're not alienating yourself. Oh, we were yourself. getting one. I think we were getting Western Mountaineering. Well, I love oh. – so I used this bag by Western Mountaineering, and it was fantastic. It's a Kodiak. They were not a sponsor, and I wish they would have been. Yeah. I would – I would test their bags if they were like, we want you to go to the Arctic and test out a sleeping bag. I'd be like, okay, because that bag was fantastic. <laughs> um, they make really good stuff. Oh, yeah. so that's what we need. We need the listeners to DM Mountain Westerneering. Nope, Western Mountaineering. And just be like, Emily Ford would test your bag so hard. <laughs> <laughs> Dab them, test them the fuck out of your bags. <laughs> like, you know who needs to be testing your bags right now? Yeah. Like, I totally, <laughs> like, but any, any, like, viable 
See, but like, I'm not so much of like a gear nerd where I'm like, oh, like only this company. Like if your gear is solid and you stand by that and like, you're not a dick to the, to the wilderness by your product, like those are the people I want to use. So like, I, I didn't find 40 below 40 below has been around for a while. But they make these really simple in camp booties and they make these super rad koozies for your nail jeans. Hmm. And like they're such a simple company. Well, I don't know if they're simple, but their products are so simple and I fell in love with their gear right away. And like hmm. those are the companies that like I think are super rad. Those are the ones I want to like if I was gonna become like that type of influencer, like those are the brands I want to back. It doesn't have to be like a big name like Patagonia, although hey Patagonia, totally fine. <laughs> uh, it can be any you know, other brands too, you know. Yeah. So let's talk about your gear. I'm I'm fascinated by this because this is so outside of my realm. Uh, let's go with the, the your big three first. Your tent, sleeping bag. You mentioned the sleeping bag and your pack. Uh, Glen Beulah. Glen Beulah is the name of my backpack. I named her, <laughs> I named her that because it sounds like a big girl name. Like she's like a big girl, you know, <laughs> a big farm girl. <laughs> she was gigantic. <laughs> uh, yeah, my backpack is by Granite Gear, who actually did become a sponsor. Um, they were the nice. they were the first sponsor that I had gotten. Um, and I'm looking up this way because I'm looking at all oh, my stuff is hanging in this room. Um, <laughs> and it is the Nimbus Trace 70 plus 10. So it's a big, it's a very large pack. She's a big girl. She's a big, girl. Yeah. Um, big farm girl. Big farm girl. And one of the cool things about <laughs> Grand Care, A, they're so close to where I live. They're in Two Harbors. So they're just a spit up the trail here. And they will fit your pack to you and they will they'll do everything in their power to make sure that your pack feels very comfortable to you. So I really appreciated that. Um, and I packed that to the gills. Um, they, yeah. unfortunately, they don't make the Nimbus trace anymore. Um, it was just, it wasn't affordable for folks. So they stopped making it. Um, sleeping bag was by Western Mountaineering. It's the Kodiak. Uh, I believe it's rated for negative 30 degrees and it's lovely. And mm -hmm. one of the things I really liked about that sleeping bag because speaking of sleeping with dogs in your sleeping bags, I used to sleep with my dog in my sleeping bag, but I'm pretty broad shouldered and I'm pretty broad hipped. And this is a, this is either unisex or a men's bag. And it had room in the knees. Like I could stuff all my clothes in the bottom of it to keep it, to keep my clothes dry and warm and from freezing at nighttime and to dry out my socks. And so I had a bunch of clothes in there with me and there was still tons of room in there for like heat to gather mm -hmm. between my body um and the outside air so that was super awesome uh so negative 30 were you ever cold overnight in that thing no mm -mm. no and the, the coldest yeah, i probably so. slept was probably negative 25 in that bag damn yeah i don't know what the wind how much does a how much does a negative 30 degree bag weigh and i know they do really good stuff so this is probably like the lightest negative yes. 30 degree bag that you're gonna get i can't remember how heavy this this um remember how heavy it is but it's not it's freaking light it is mm -hmm. and it packs down it packs down amazingly small like extremely small i was my my brain every time i packed it down every morning i was like damn this thing is sick <laughs> um mm -hmm. yeah i love that thing i could spend probably the rest of my life sleeping in that thing um and then the rest of my sleep system was by thermal rest um so i had an inflatable uh, Neo Air, and then I had everybody's probably first camping pad, the Z Light, the one that crinkles mm -hmm. up that folds into like an accordion. Um, that was Tom still uses it. Uh, I love. Uh, Zach taught me that I'm supposed to buy new ones. I know. Every now and then, I, know. I didn't know. Mine's that. Mine's like this. There's like a pain. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> That's what mine was, and I like brought it here because we were looking at my gear or something, and he was like, "How how old is that?" And I was like, "I don't know." I bought my partner yeah. one for the birthday or for Christmas. Well, I don't know, maybe last year. And I was like, this is so thick. I'm like, why is mine so yeah. pushed? I know. It's like double the size when you first buy it. But truly. But it still did a really good job of keeping the frost off of my... I, it was just a good... The R value was still there, even if the R value was one. Whatever. Better than zero. My tent. Uh, yeah, so I borrowed the tent. I didn't have any more money left to buy gear. And I hammock camp. So I didn't really have a tent to bring on this trip. Um, it's a 1989 Sierra Designs CD clip flashlight. She's an old girl, but 
did a it was <laughs> an old girl <laughs> uh, but it did really well the, the downside of that tent though is that there's no um ventilation so the outside's mm -hmm. so not mesh at all um it's all just the whatever fabric they make it out of and so in the morning we would wake up and it'd be snowing on us from the moisture of our yeah. breath yeah and uh that was tough yeah, those single wall tents when there's that much contrast and temperature the inside of the outside is yeah you're gonna get some moisture in there for sure but staying warm is really the thing that matters yeah. um i want to know what you wore while you were hiking because the lowest temperatures i saw in the at were in the single digits mm -hmm. and i was freezing in what i was wearing so the first thing i think when we talk about this is just my mind is just stuck on what were you wearing while you were walking Right, so we can start at the head. I had just like a merino wool hat. I don't, let's just say on an average day. Well, I don't know. Do you want to hear about cold days or just average days, I guess? <laughs> let's run, let's run the gamut, yeah. Everything. So like on an average day, I would wear just like a, a merino wool hat, very thin. Um, and then I was wearing two base layers um, towards the end of the trip. I don't think I... That wasn't necessary for other days, but it's just how my clothes were stacked. And then I have like a, I have a, like a dry fit shirt that I got from like a Tough Mudder. Um, then I would wear like a raincoat or a wind coat on top of that. And that was pretty much it. Um, and then for my bottoms, I had two base layers and then um, I had pants by uh, Fjell Raven. I would just wear that. And then my boots were by Bath and Boots in the beginning. And then I wore right through the soles of those. And then Solomon boots, and I would wear, you know, a hiking sock, some merino wool hiking sock, and then I wore, I had several pairs of hand handwares, so I have some chunky mittens, some thin mittens, and then like dollar fifty cotton gloves just to keep the wind off, and then on a cold day, on the top I just I had the kind of a puffy coat I'd wear over all of that, um, and then on the down or synthetic? Syn synthetic, because feathers and I, no, no, ma'am, no, ma'am. Uh -huh. I had I, I had a feather coat for two months maybe, and I had to bring it back. It was it was by Duluth Trading, and I just <laughs> I was like, you guys, you need to give me a different. I also I work for them, and so I was like, you need to send. I need a new coat because I can't. Is it because of allergies? What's that? Because like I'm I'm well, I'm wondering why. Oh, I just why have holes in them. Part? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Because I, I used to be allergic, like, really badly to goose down. So that was what I was thinking was, like, it would give you hives or something. Nope. I am just very aggressive on gear. I am, like, if anybody wants to tough, test the toughness of their gear, like, I'm the one to go to. Because I will just, I'm really good at poking holes and stuff. Um, you can give it the stamp Ford Tough? Come on. It's too easy. <laughs> <laughs> can we, though? Can we, though? I'm sorry. I'm a 28 years of my <laughs> life. <laughs> I'm a dad. I had no choice on that one. <laughs> um, but on, so on the bottoms, on top of my uh, normal pants, I again, I ran out of money. So I bought these $12 military liners. I don't know. They were cheap. And then over that, I would put a wind pant to make like a faux uh, snow pant on really cold days. And I'd wear actually the wind pants quite often. I got some nasty frostbite on the old butt after a while. The butt's a hard, the butt. the butt's a hard spot to keep warm. And what I should have, I should have figured out how to buy um, puffy shorts. That would have been, that would have been clutch. If I could have added any gear, it would have been puffy shorts. Yeah. Interesting. So do you have like weird numbness issues on your butt now, or are you totally recovered from the frostbite? It's very tender and I have some nasty scars. Uh, I was, I'm almost wondering like if numbness would be an advantage because I hate sitting on a bike seat, but if I was totally numb down there. No, it, my butt gets really cold too. It's not, it's not pleasant. Uh -uh. No. That's like mm -hmm. the coldest part of my body yeah. and there's nothing you can do to warm it up. Yep. Interesting. Except for like put your hands on it and kind of just like hope. Yeah. Mm. yeah. <laughs> I will warm my butt with hope. <laughs> uh, okay. Interesting. Um, so you didn't, you did this entire trail without snow pants. That's amazing to me. Well, when you, so, I mean, have you ever, do you do. Would snow pants be too high? Yes. Because the whole, the whole yeah. thing is layering. So I never right. had the thickest, the thickest thing I had was my coat. Um, everything else were just like thin little layers 
that could trap heat in between them. I could take them on and take them off. And when you sweat, you want to be able to peel away different layers so you can have dry layers. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I mean, like intuitively, obviously, I know these things, but I've also never hiked in negative thirty degree temperatures. So, like, it's such a foreign thing for me that um, I'm I'm learning all this from you right yeah. now. Well, yeah. I mean, and it's it's you know when people think of Minnesota, they're like, oh, you must always be bundled, and it's just not true because as soon as your body starts moving, it'll warm up. It, it, mm -hmm. Like just in like the, any other athletic situation. The thing is, that your hands are pretty. It's hard for your hands and your toes, but your core is will be pretty warm. So you had no issue with frostbite on your fingers or well, toes. I mean, they got a little frost nip because in the morning, <laughs> because in the morning I would put on frozen boots pretty much. Yeah. That, Did you stop throughout the day to change your socks a, a number of times? How many socks did you break? The mo I had so many socks. Um, also people kept giving me socks. So that's another reason too, but I would not change my sock during the day. You could not have paid me enough money to take off my boots during the daytime and put them back on. Mm. But I did, um, at nighttime when I got into camp, I I'm not actively working on TMing this, but I would love to, it's called the three sock system. Um, and coming into camp and putting on dry socks, right? So you have your hiking socks and the socks that you change into when you get into camp, but your feet are wet. So technically you're using that sock to dry off your foot, put your foot like in your in-camp booty. And then when you go to bed, take off those socks and put on your actual dry pair of socks to sleep in. And that will keep your feet way drier because by that time your feet are actually dry-ish. So you have a wet sock, a damp sock, and a dry sock. And never mix them up. Yep. Don't ever mix them up. <laughs> uh, damn, that's fascinating. So... <clears throat> I'm just trying to think like, what other dumb gear questions can I ask? Were your shoes water? Like, did you get waterproof shoes or like, were they Gore-Tex ones? How did you keep you from needing to change your socks throughout the day at all? Well, I'm curious as to why you feel like I would need to change my socks during the day. I picture with you post holing a bunch, snow getting in there and your feet being cold and wet and it just getting really, really cold right. on your toes. Right. Yeah, gaiters would probably help the whole situation of snow going in your boot. Um, oh, yeah. But I did have that situation. It's okay. I did have that situation um, a couple times. But. Uh, so you didn't have gaiters? I did have gaiters. Yeah. I oh, was okay. just sometimes lazy in the morning and wouldn't put them on. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I did have that situation. But uh, yeah, you couldn't have paid me enough money to take off my boot in that situation. And usually that's not my toes wouldn't be cold at that time of day because my blood would be moving enough to get blood down there. It was just like putting on a frozen boot in the morning and they're frozen because I sweat into my boot and that sweat just ultimately freezes and a little bit of snow that would end up in there. Um, and that shocked my system. And then for the next like two hours, just warming them up, you just have to move. Um, and there's a misnomer about, um, we gotta, I gotta move with us for a little bit. I gotta grab my charger, but there's a misnomer with um, hand warmers and people think that hand warmers will work in any situation. And that's just not true. As soon as a hand warmer gets wet, it doesn't work anymore. That iron inside the hand warmer doesn't want to heat up anymore. Um, and you have to, it has to stay dry. So yeah, you're keeping those in Ziploc bags just to keep them safe and dry? Uh, in their packages, they're totally fine. They work just fine oh, right, right, out of their right. package. But um, as soon as, so like people, a lot of people ask, they're like, why don't you just put hand warmers inside your, because there's toe warmers that you can stick in your shoe. Mm -hmm. But if your feet are wet, that iron doesn't want to actually activate because they need air to work. They don't need water to work. Hmm. Also, hiking in snow for long periods of time is blinding. So are you hiking with sunglasses? Are you wearing goggles? What's the eyewear for that? Um, I had ski goggles a little bit on really sunny days, but I wear glasses in my normal life. Mm -hmm. So I did not wear sunglasses. I did not have prescription sunglasses or anything like that for that trip. So, um, are you using, are you using trekking poles? Absolutely. I loved, honestly, I used to give people so much shit for using trekking poles. I was like, oh, that's an old lady thing. And then <laughs> I started, I started finally using trekking poles as an adult. And I was like, these things are the shit. Like my, I can, 
I can cruise. I could probably I could probably hike pretty consistently like four miles an hour if I didn't have a ridiculously heavy pack on with trekking poles. I feel like that's a pretty common evolution. Like most people want to start off without trekking poles. I think they just think it, like you said, it, it feels like an old lady move or like it just looks stupid or like, you know, they've done so much walking without it that they don't understand the practicality of it. And then, yeah, once you get used to it, you've got four appendages that are powering you up hills and just moving you along. It's, it is definitely like, it's hard to go back after using trekking poles. Although Trance is saying it's trekking pole. She's no trekking what? pole. Didn't you go without trekking poles on Catalina? They took them from me in the airport. Oh, no. Oh, right. <laughs> like, yeah. What are you talking about? Yeah. Well, the, the airport is anti Um poles. Yeah, I mean, I've gone like days at a time without using them if it's more comfortable um, in the moment. But I feel like, because I used to feel the same way where it was like, I don't need these, but I was always doing day hikes. Like I was never doing anything where it was like piling pain on pain on pain. And I think when you do a long hike and you realize like, how much the pain starts to stack, that's where you really start to appreciate the trekking poles, whereas I might have laughed at them on day hikes mm -hmm. in the past. Mm -hmm. So kind of bringing it back to the fanfare of your hike, um, I feel like it's, it's, it's worth mentioning here that you are a gay black hiker going through Wisconsin doing this thing. Um, but I've I've read from some of your articles that you didn't want that to be a cornerstone of your hike. So we don't have to touch on it too much, but I'm just curious to know, um, obviously it's, it's gotta be important to inspire other people that, you know, aren't the ones that you envision out on the trail. So can you speak to that a little bit? For sure. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, I just like had this belief that the outdoors is for everybody. And I think that kind of became something I coined on my trip a little bit, you know, like, there's kind of no limit to who can be outside. And I, I think one thing that stops a lot of people from doing whatever things that they want to pursue is that they don't see people like them doing it, which, is, which isn't the best excuse, but definitely valid in a lot of situations, you know? And so sure. I'm hoping, you know, before I, and that was something that I kind of caught on to before I left. I was like, hey, if anybody... If anybody in the world, you know, sees this, I hope that they understand that. Like, I firmly believe that anybody can hike and I hope they kind of they feel like that's, you know, a decent thing. But at the end of the day, it was a lot of, especially a lot of, like flash media, you know, when I'd be on like news, more like newscasts or anything like that when I had those interviews. It was always so funny, these like adjectives that would come before my name or like before like through hike. And I was like, damn it. Like, I just mm -hmm. want to be a through hiker. Like, this is a, if this was a white dude, they would not be like, white, blue-eyed, straight, cis male <laughs> through yeah. hikes, such and such trail in the winter. Like, they would just be like, oh, through hiking, male, blah, blah, blah. And so, like... Carl did it. <laughs> like, yeah. And so it's <laughs> like, I understand the importance of, you know, featuring that and talking about that because truly, like, that's so deep within my heart of, like, I want everybody to feel comfortable in the outdoors. And I know that's not true for everybody. But also, I just, like, I'm like... I also am just like, I'm just a backpacker, like the both of you, like there's nothing, there's mm -hmm. nothing more special about me than you guys, except for that there's more people that look like you who do it. You know, that's probably, that's pretty much it. I'd say you're more special in your ability to withstand <laughs> cold temperatures. <laughs> <laughs> so don't take that away from yeah, yourself. Do, right? <laughs> yeah. I'm curious, have you gotten messages from other hikers saying that your journey has inspired them or they have questions about the particulars of your journey or anything like that? Yeah, lots of questions. Lots of questions from hikers, non-hikers, walkers, like lots of, in the beginning or like in, towards the middle, it was a lot of like parents, um, like asking like how you know, do they get their kid into something like this? And my response is, my response to any parent out there is just like, look, I'm not a parent, so I'll preface that. Um, but like your kids just watch everything you do, right? Like if you're outside, they're going to be outside. If you're on your phone doing whatever, they're going to want to be on their future phone doing whatever. Like it's just, it's, it's systemic, right? It just goes, it just goes down, down, down through the lines. Mm, to lead by example. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So I'm curious now, you just come off of this crazy feat. What hikes do you have now on your bucket list? Like, do you feel like you have the through hiking bug? I know this wasn't your first through hike, um, but yeah, what else are you targeting? Are you looking to stay in the Midwest? Do you want to get out and do something in the East, AT, get out West? What are you thinking? 
Yeah, so I only have that little window, right? So I only have three months to really do anything substantial. I could maybe stretch it to four if my if I can cajole my boss into letting me have more time off. Um, I know I'm or- looking at the Oregon Desert Trail um, to do yeah. that in the winter time. That's one I'd probably do a lot of research for because I have never. I've only spent a couple of days out in the desert. It was for a geology field trip down in Texas, so I don't have a lot of um, desert experience. So that's what I'd probably do a lot for. Have you been in touch with Renee Patrick at all? That name does not sound familiar. I believe I forget. I think she's the executive director of that trail. I know she's like one of the one of the people that started it. Um, but she's a former guest of the show. I'm happy to put you in touch if if you sure. want. I, I guarantee you there's not many people that know that trail better than she yeah. does. Um, yeah, Oregon Desert Trail. That's another, you you like challenging hikes. Well, here's the thing. I want to, I like hikes that nobody else are, is doing. I don't want to see people. Yeah. <laughs> like, I don't, I don't <laughs> always do them. Because here's the thing. Like, I think <clears throat> one day I would love to, you know, be a triple crowner and like live in the glory of that. But like, honestly, I, so many people are on those trails, you know, like so many people. Yeah. And like, I hope to like, I don't want, I'm just like not a party kid. I'm really pretty boring. Like even at home, like my partner and I, we go to bed like at, you know, nine, nine 30, we drink a little bit of tea before bed. Like we hunger down, get up at like six in the morning. Like I'm pretty basic when it comes to that. And like the party lifestyle that I've seen that can happen on like the ATPCT. I'm just like, I'm just not ready for that quite yet. I'm not ready to hike with that many people yet. And I know you can do it solo, but you're still going to meet a bunch of people or see people. Yeah. So like I'm I'm yeah. more fighting for trails that like nobody does, so I can just kind of be alone <laughs> on them. Sure. What's what, your? Go ahead. What was the longest amount of days you went on the Ice Age Trail without seeing another person? Not long. Or not long, but but. Uh, I did not see any other hikers. Zero hikers. Lots of people would come out to like, find me, or like meet mm. me on the trail. Do you not like struggle with just feeling like stir crazy and bored and just wanting someone else to talk to besides just being in your head? Because I feel like that would drive me up an absolute right. wall. Uh, well, I mean, I process a lot of stuff with Diggins, right? So, and I would probably do that even if, if she wasn't there. I'd probably talk to myself quite a bit. Um, and yeah, of course I got bored. I mean, and we all get bored and it would just turn into like, I just mostly sang whatever song I could think of the lyrics to, you know, and just like past time, like with Diggins, especially, I would like try to over explain humanity to her while we were hiking and like over explain <laughs> like why humans act in the way that they do. Um, and like get really oddly philosophical with her sometimes. So like you just figure out ways to pass the time. And I, it's, I think it's good. I think it's good for people to spend time alone with themselves because it, it's scary, right? Like what if you run out of things to think about? You know, like, what if you don't have any service and you can't, like, distract your brain with, like, social media? Like, what are you going to do? <laughs> you know? It is it is strange. Like, boredom is almost a thing of the past if you let it be. And I just remember as a kid, like, dealing with boredom all the time. And I feel like that's where a lot of creativity comes oh, from, yeah. is the space. And it's just so easy to never have – I'm guilty of this myself – just to never have that space away from screens and input and stimulus. And, yeah, I think mm-hmm. – something like what you did is uh, a really precious opportunity to find that. Um, to that point, you actually, you have a quote, I think this was in um, the Backpacker article that uh, Patricia Cameron did, former guest. Uh, and the quote is, I like to tackle really hard topics that I've struggled with and go through the different parts of forgiz- forgiveness while I hike. So can you elaborate on what you mean here? And I, I think that a lot of people use hiking as like a means to process things. And I'm just curious, like how that interfaced with your journey. Yeah. Well, and here's the thing, like with your question as well of like, what do you do when you're bored? Because your your brain will come up with a topic for you to t- for you to tackle. And you have to say yes to doing it, right? So there's, we all carry baggage, right? We all, we all have things that we need to massage out in our lives and and work through past relationships or past dealings with ourselves or like past hurts or, you know, anything like that and past struggles. And you can say no to processing that on the trail. You can distract yourself with other things, but I really love taking that time to like pick apart the situation that I was in and just like, 
where was I and what was I feeling? What was the other person feeling? Like, do I feel like I'm ready to like put in an ounce of forgiveness or like grace? Can I give my former self, like my, my younger self grace for like how I acted or how I, whatever, like the other person, am I ready for that? And for me, I can think for hours and hours and like, I have to hike long distances to exhaust my thoughts. I'm just that type of person. And I, there were some topics that would come up in my mind that I, like, I just wasn't ready to tackle. And they were just a little too, they're just a too raw for me to really dive into. Um, but there were other past things that I was finally ready to, that I had tried in other hikes to deal with, but I couldn't. So, yeah. Yeah, I think having that space is very therapeutic because when you're busy, it's just like you have to bury it because you can't deal with it while you're at work. Like you just it doesn't do it doesn't cooperate. Uh, so I think having the time and the space to like really process those things is very valuable. Um, so I mean, actually, before we before we wrap this up, I want to learn more about your life as the head gardener at the historic house in Duluth. <laughs> yeah. uh, how did you get how did you get into that and if if someone went to the historic house like what are they going to see when they're there yeah that i fell into that job just like i fell i fall into a lot of things in my life it was an opportunity and i applied for it and i interviewed for it and i got it i was extremely underqualified for that job um, but i'm the head gardener they're now much more qualified thank goodness i've been there for four years and um yeah, I love it. So it's Glen Sheen, the Historic House Museum on Lake Superior. And it is a very old house built in 1908. So when you get there, you'll see the house and you'll see what I take care of, which are the gardens. There's a beautiful like formal flower garden. There's a vegetable garden. I grow fruit trees, grow lots of fruit. Um, you'll see my dog because he comes to work with me and he's very cute. And <laughs> that's that. Yeah, it's right on Lake Superior. It's super awesome. I love working right on the lake. She's kind of a bear, but very cool too. Mm -hmm. So very cool. Well, thank you for walking us through your Ice Age Trail winter hike. That is bananas. Um, before we wrap, is there? I know you've got an Instagram account that's growing pretty rapidly. What can we plug for you here? How can we help you out? Yeah, I mean, yeah. If you want to follow along uh, for any other trips coming up, uh, at Emily on Trails, where you can find me. Um, for right now, you'll mostly see like a lot of pictures of my dog and like little trips that we do and goats, lots of goats in my life. I'm a goat apprentice. It's kind of a weird side, side thing. What's a goat apprentice? What's that? Side, but what's a goat apprentice? Right. So I apprentice under a goat farmer. <laughs> um, she does milking goats. Um, so I milk, I help her milk and I'm learning about kind of herding culture and how to become um, a good goat herder. And she has a couple sheep as well. That. I love yeah, I say it multiple times in my Instagram. I love goats. Do you think your dog knew that you were cheating on? Was your dog a boy or girl? He's a boy. He definitely knew. Because when I got back home, he was salty. <laughs> he was so angry. With me. You know, like how you see those. Um, there's all those clips of like men and women coming home from like the military, and their dogs are like so excited to see them. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. My partner let my dog go in the park and he can be off leash and he's totally fine. And he like bolted it straight towards me and like just took a hard left and ran away. Like didn't want to have anything to do with me. He was so salty with me. It took about it took about a week before he was like happy that I was home. Yeah. That's oh. funny. That's... Um I have one more question. Okay. We really like animal facts here, specifically mm -hmm. mostly horses. We're big horse girls, but do you have any fun goat facts for us? Um, weird things goats do that maybe people don't know about? Weird goats do. Oh, it's so weird. <laughs> they're, they're weird overall. Jeepers, Moses. When they're little, this, and I think a lot of people have probably seen this, but it's true and it happens in real life. When they're, when they're kids, when they're little and they grow up big enough, they do just bounce around. They literally just hop like this. And what they'll do is they'll stand on top of the backs of the older goats and they'll just stand up there and then they'll bounce off of that one and then they'll bounce to the next elder goat and they'll just bounce around like popcorn. And it's the strangest thing. I'd only seen it in videos and I thought it was like a type of goat. I'm pretty sure it's mostly all goats that bounce around like that when they're little. Huh. 
I and like and the elders don't get pissed off. I just feel like even a baby goat with the hooves is like, that's going <laughs> to not feel awesome. Yeah. I don't, I mean, some of them are crankier than others. Another thing that people don't yeah. know is that you, just like horses, you need to clip the nails. You need to clip the hooves of a goat as oh. well. How often? Oh, it could probably be done um, probably every other week if you really wanted to be on top of it, but once a month is that often. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you really wanted to be up on yeah. if you wanted to like show it, but you can do it probably just once a month. I know people who only do it once a year. Is it like dogs where like if they walk on concrete a lot, they kind of file them down themselves or is it just a task you got to do? It's a do? task you got to do. Yeah. Huh. Okay. You're stranded on an island and you can only bring goat's cheese or regular like cow's cheese. Goat. Oh yeah. my, I think, I think I currently eat more goat cheese. I <laughs> I'm trying to think, do I want, my, I, I need to make that I want to be out in the world? For, I, I love goats so much. So the, the, the ah, for fuck's sake. Okay, so the first thing, what I wanted to do the most, <laughs> my entire life, I've always wanted to drink milk straight from either a goat or a cow. And when I started uh, apprenticing underneath Jan, I was like, I know this is this is my first day. I was like, I know this is weird. <laughs> but can I just squeeze the milk right into my mouth? And she was like, oh, yeah, for sure. And I was like, I'm so glad you think that's so normal. And it was the coolest experience of my life because it's warm. It's so warm coming out of their body. Um, it's so weird that you're saying this is cool. It was, you know what's <laughs> crazy? It was, like, it was just so exhilarating. Because it's warm. I'm like, <laughs> right. you never... <laughs> like you never hear anything about goat's milk, even though goat's cheese is very common. Why don't people drink goat's because, milk? Because so you have to, after you get it out, you have to chill it. You have to chill it. If you don't, it will taste very farmy. And people don't like farmy mm. flavors, just like why people don't like venison usually, or if they don't like duck, um, if they don't like wild turkey, people don't like the actual flavors of what animals are supposed to taste like. Um, right. Yeah. Too gamey. Right. And there's different, so different goats give off different milk. So where I, who I, hang out with she has these little goats well you can't really see because you're seeing a screen they're like only a couple feet long but their milk is like super creamy you can make like caramels out of them you can make like yogurt out of them it's delicious i'm telling you it's like a weird this is gonna fall into a triple crown so oh, well definitely definitely, definitely. Anyway. uh well emily awesome this was i'm honestly super fascinated with your hike i, I think what you did was super badass and I hope you appreciate how badass it was. Uh, I assume by all the attention that you're getting because of it, you're, you're probably realizing it somewhat, but as someone that lived in Wisconsin, I know that that's batshit crazy and you, you made it look, or at least you're making it sound relatively easy. So kudos to you. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, everyone go follow Emily on Instagram and yeah, thank you so much for joining us. Really <laughs> thank appreciate you so it. much.